say live. We'll be going. <laughs> Great. Here we go. Live. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Robust American Love. Hey, My name is. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Robust American Love. My name is Karen Carviner, and I am president of the Walt Whitman Initiative. We're in 501c3 nonprofit organization with a mission of celebrating New York City's literary legacy. We serve as an organizing center for all sorts of cultural activism and poetry related events, like this robust American Love speaker series that we've got going on. Please follow us on Instagram and on Facebook and tune into our YouTube channel to explore more presentations in this series. And if you like what we're doing, there are many ways to support our programs and initiatives. Please visit support us at our website to find a PayPal link and address for checks. We're fueled by our love of poetry, but we need you to sustain our programs, events, and initiatives. And we actually have a really special one going on now for our friend, Greg Truppiano, who I think many people out there, the name will be familiar. Greg was a very significant cultural activist in Brooklyn and uh, unfortunately passed away in early 2020. We are trying to commemorate him with a park bench. So that is our latest thing in Fort Greene Park where he held a lot of his events and tours. So if you're interested in that, one way to get to know what we're doing is to check out our newsletter. And from our website, the Walt Whitman Initiative, you'll see a link that takes you right to our newsletter. You can sign up to get them every month. At the beginning of the month, we just released one. And I wanna shout out to uh, Dee Kui and Becky Oliveira, who both, without them, this newsletter would never happen. Uh, and that details lots of things that are going on besides us, but uh, has the link for this Fort Greene Park bench if you're interested in helping us put up a bench in Greg's honor. But as for this particular series, um, you know, we're very happy with where this is going. Notice that it's a series, it's a series of speakers. These are not lectures, these are not academic presentations, but conversations. And, and many of them kind of revolve somehow about around Whitman's life and legacy, although that's very loosely understood by us. You'll hear all sorts of conversations by poets, teachers, grad students, uh, printers, neighborhood activists, artists like today. Um, so please tune in for them. We always try to have a little bit of space for Q&A at the end. Uh, they're always Tuesdays, 6 to 7 p.m. Uh, we try to keep it just an hour um, so that you know what you're getting. And you can visit the archive of what we've done up at the Whitman Initiative site. We've got a whole, I don't even know how many at this point, but at maybe 30 uh, different speaking, um, different speaker series. So just a few things before we get to Patrice and Tim. Um, I wanted to also mention that the New York City Poetry Festival is coming up on July 24th and 25th on Governor's Island this year. We are very excited. We are silver sponsors of the Poetry Festival. And I think many of us have resolved to get there on the 25th, the July 25th. So if you wanna check out our table and hopefully we'll have some fun stuff to do, uh, please visit on July 25th and of course on July 24th, um, you know, to, to see all of these spectacular readings, events, booths, uh, merchandise that they have going on. I also wanted to put in a word for July 16th tour that I'm doing to the Ryerson Street House for Untapped Cities. So if you are in New York and you're interested in doing a walking tour, a Whitman walking tour of Brooklyn. I will be doing that this Friday, July 16th at 5 p.m., starting from the top of Fort Greene Park by the visitor center there. And the idea is to take us through Whitman's Brooklyn, point out sites, read some poetry on the way, and then the last stop, that final um, extant house of Walt Whitman's of over 30 in New York, just one standing, which we have been trying to protect. And uh, it's where he finished Leaves of Grass, actually. So um, really worth seeing. 
On August 10th, our next robust American love is called Tenant and Mortist in Granite, Walt Whitman in Canada. And I am so excited to welcome a dear friend, Julia Garo, who is the head of the Canadian Whitmanites. And she is a very special person. She raises alpacas in Canada, and she also is heading this wonderful group of people. Her associate, Jordan Bon Gore, who I met this year because they both participated in the Song of Myself Marathon. If you want to check them out, you can on our YouTube site. So, so they've been doing some really awesome stuff up there, including their own Song of Myself Marathon. And um, her description says that we inspired their marathon, which I take as a great honor. They do it on the shores of Ontario's Mazinaw Lake. And they started doing that in 2017. I went in 2019 and it was spectacular. So hopefully with COVID behind us, maybe next year, Julia will be able to revive that. Uh, she's going to be talking about what they do, but also Whitman's very deep legacy in Canada. Horace Traubel was a Canadian and there were a whole bunch of others. Uh, so we will open up that conversation, which is not often um, held. I should just say that Julia, in addition to just being an amazing human being and an alpaca farmer, is also an incredible yoga instructor. And she was also the editor of Extra, which is Canada's leading LGBTQ2S plus magazine. So she's just like a force of nature. Um, I love her and uh, she's magnetic and wonderful. So please don't miss her on August 10th. Um, today, oh my goodness, today is very special because I also know very dearly one of the speakers today, and I love the title, Cruising Daddy on the Street, I Ping the Body Electric, and Queer Artistic Lineages. And I'd like to welcome Tim Cusack and Patrice Miller to Robust American Love. Hey guys. Hey. Hey Tim. Hi Patrice. Hey. Hi. So, so lovely to have you both join us. I'm just going to say a couple of words and then maybe we can open up the conversation. Uh, what we are talking about today is a site specific performance piece that Tim and uh, Patrice have been working on and have actually shown now twice, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So it's been twice. It's called I Ping the Body Electric which is a line by line, syllable by syllable rewiring of Whitman's iconic ode. So uh, Tim and Patrice take that groundbreaking epic poem, I Sing the Body Electric and they make it new. And we're gonna hear Tim, right? Re recite parts of it for us, bring it to life with Patrice maybe bringing us into that theater space uh, and hear about all the, um, the, the energy, the scholarship, uh, you know, the activism that propels this project forward. It's, it's amazing. Um, and Tim has written a blurb that you may have seen on our website where he writes, he wrote it during a, the pandemic lockdown in the spring and summer of 2020. So it's a product of our time. Um, and it also kind of hinges on crises, right? HIV, AIDS, COVID, and the ongoing brutalization and fetishization of bodies of African descent. So um, a performance piece, but also very much an activist uh, piece. Very, very proud to have Tim Cusack with us today, who was the co-founder and artistic director of Theater Askew. That was the company that put that um, Ada yeah. Isaac's Mink play on at La Mama yeah. Theater. That's how I met Tim, yeah. which was an incredible production. The name of that play again was? Uh, uh, horseplay or? Horseplay. No, no, wait, wait, horseplay. Okay. I know it's got a long, yeah. The Fickle Mistress, a protean picaresque. I, uh, the wonderful downtown playwright and rock and tour and critic, uh, Trav S.D., Travis Stewart, who goes by Trav S.D. Um, and it was a play that um, 
I commissioned. Um, we had gotten the very good fortune of being offered a slot at La Mama in the Ellen Stewart Theater, which is in downtown theater, that's like playing the palace. I mean, that's like, that's the, the ultimate. And so we knew that we wanted to do something really spectacular. And the life of Ada Isaacs Mencken is pretty spectacular. And um, she was one of those people who knew everybody, kind of she made it her point to know everybody who was anybody. And so she um, was Whitman's poetry protege um, in New York City in the 1850s. And that's how Whitman comes into this whole thing. I just love this. I know we're gonna have such a great conversation because <laughs> Tim and Patrice both know 19th century cultural history and he is so right about Ada Isaacs Mencken, who is a centerpiece in the bohemian culture of New York City at that time. Yeah. So I met Tim uh, on a tour of um, Whitman's Bohemian New York, and I had brought the, the people on the tour down to Faff's Cellar, P-F-A-F-F -F -F apostrophe S, which was the the, center, the centerpiece, right? Like that's where everybody met. That's where Ada went. That's where Walt hung out, met his boyfriends down there. Um, so this whole rich history of mid 19th century Bohemia is very much a kind of, you know, place, a meeting place for, for you and Patrice and me actually, in addition to the Bohemians themselves. Yeah. Now well, I, I know I for- took, a, I, I, for I took that tour, Karen, because one of the locations of the play is Faf's Tavern. And so when I heard about it, I was like, I gotta do this, I gotta see this. And I, I just wanna tag on, yes, absolutely Bohemia, but also that history of LGBTQ spaces in New York City, right? Because that basement absolutely. club kid in the 90s and that basement so reminded me of spaces that I was in that were clubs and you know, alternative spaces when I was active in that whole nightlife scene. So it's amazing how the more things change, the more they stay the same. Like there's this amazing through line in New York history of those types of places. That's, uh, it's such a good point, Tim. And actually um, it is thought that the first gay men's club, the Fred Gray Association met at Foff's cellar. We have records of that. So wow. uh, Foff's has a, an actual, yeah, there, it's in the letters that Whitman wrote to his friends and his boyfriends at the time. And Fred Gray was an actual character, right? Like, like one of the guys who was central in that group. But you're right about that place having a resonance, um, you know, a, a kind of a, a, an afterlife, um, because upstairs in that same building in the 1970s, Love Saves the Day was up there with, oh, uh, right. who was that? Mancuso, right? Yeah, um, right. David Mancuso was up there. So there's, that space was, and, and he held like the first house parties and yes. gay, straight, whoever you were, you yeah. were invited. Right. Uh, so there's this wonderful openness to that space. Um, and I think there is something to thinking about that subterranean, you know, that underground idea, right? Mm -hmm. Fox was the original subterranean hangout. Yeah. And yeah. so what was permitted and respectable on, on street level um, got kind of like, you know, um, deconstructed in the space of Fox Cellar. <laughs> so it was really a permissive space. Uh, so well, we could go on and on. We have to get to your show, but um, <laughs> in any case. Whatever, it's all good. Um, just one other point though, I think it's also, but there was also a, a mixing of class too in that space, right? Like it was also not just about sexuality. And no, no worry. She back. Looks like our wonderful host Do is you having. You all hear me because I have drama. Drama. <laughs> Suspense. Will she come back? What happens next? 
Hi. Well, Whitman never had to <laughs> deal with Zoom. I'm here. Can oh, you guys see me? Here, we can see you. I think your connection was disrupted, though. Karen, why don't you try to? Can you? Oh, hear there me you now? go. Yeah. Yeah, you're back. Right here. I think you're whole again. With a small <laughs> Thank you. Delay. Sorry, I don't know what happened. <laughs> okay, I hope that my uh, connection is stable enough to host the show, but uh, I guess you guys will let me know if it does not. <laughs> um, uh, just picking up the pieces, Tim, I was going to introduce a few other things that you've done, um, and sure. the list is very long. Uh, I know for Theater Askew, you, you did quite a few productions. You co-adapted, co-directed, and appeared as Caligula in the company's six-part serial adaptation of I, Claudius, a huge production. Uh, and directed the New York premiere of William M. Hoffman's Cornberry, The Queen's Governor, with David Greenspan and Everett Quinton. Mm -hmm. um, a few other notes. Uh, Tim appeared on stage for Askew in Bald Diva, which was the notable performance of the year at that time. Um, the Tempest, I Google myself. Uh, he is a Next Magazine future legend, a 2007 New York Theater.com person of the year, and was named by Next as one of the most significant figures among the new generation of out gay theater artists, and is an inductee to the Indie Theater Hall of Fame. And Tim, I know that you're teaching currently mm -hmm. at Hunter College. That's mm -hmm. really interesting, teaching acting. Yep. And um, anyway, thank you. It's just very impressive. Are you guys Are you guys hearing me? I'm I'm nervous about losing a connection here. We're We're hearing you, but you're freezing up. Am I coming across, guys? Karen, okay. you might want to turn your video I'm off temporarily. Not sure what to do about that, but uh, as if okay. So, is it better now? Can, we can hear you great. Your what? video was breaking up and jumping around. So, we'll, we can hear you now. Okay. I can. Patrice and Tim, can you hear? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Totally. Okay, great. So I will do a disappearing act now for a little while. If that makes us more stable, I'm fine with that. And I just wanna say also a few words to introduce Patrice, who is a director, choreographer, and performance artist best known for their in dis interdisciplinary performance making. Recently, she directed the premieres of This Joint is Jumpin', which featured Lilius White, um, and that was in the other palace in London. Brian Boone Karen, we've lost your Demand audio. Of Josh, a flesh and blood is in Provincetown. In the pine, all downtown credits include Mad Jenny's Love and Grief. Uh, my gosh. Well, I mean, I know what I've done. So, um, I'm not sure what to do, guys. Patrice, Hello? tell us more about what you've done. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> oh, no. What, Karen, why don't you sign up? Well, it's amazing, and come back. actually. The list is, is just so spectacular. Okay. Let me do that and uh, let us cross our fingers that this works. I'll be right back. Okay. <clears throat> so in the meantime, yeah, Patrice, mm. what are you working on right now? What is your current project? This is my current, current project. Mm. And mm -hmm. uh, the other piece I kind of have, I've, I've two, I have two other pieces uh, in various levels of 
cooking. Uh, one is uh, still in initial research, but it'll be uh, called A Kind of Hush, and it is a punk rock eulogy for Karen Carpenter of The Carpenters. Uh, and that takes a look at the role of female musicians and dysmorphia and um, what it means to be in various molds as, an, as a female artist. Uh, and then I've been working on a piece about Paula Mondersen Becker, who is uh, an, ex an early expressionist painter in Germany. Um, and How long is the turn from your ideation to the, till you start putting it together? And uh, Sometimes it depends on who funds it and how quickly that comes. Because <laughs> a lot can change when they're funny. Um, and sometimes it's also just what resources come together. Uh, I, a lot of my work is very collaborative. So finding the right people at the right time with the right calendars, you know, that we can just all kind of get together and, and jam out a couple of ideas. So, um, awesome. yeah. Karen, you yeah. look stable. <laughs> well, you know, I think that my uh, daughter has recently learned how to make movies on her oh. computer uh -oh. and it must have affected this so I'm sorry, guys. I think it should work now. It's like yeah. totally quiet in my house. And Jesse, you are grace under pressure, man. Thank you for well, stepping Patrice up. Patrice is like telling us about this. I I'm sorry, a punk rock eulogy of Karen Carpenter? Yeah, for her. I for her. So, I mean, that's an upcoming project. So, I mean, that sounds... I'll stay tuned. You keep us... <laughs> I'll pass it back over to Karen, but that is uh, <laughs> that sounds awesome. I'm excited. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jesse. And my apologies, Patrice and Tim, for that interruption, but I think we should be good now. Yeah. Um, in any case, just uh, sorry about the breakup of those introductions, but I guess what's really clear is that you're both quite accomplished and you're both New York-based, but have done... Yeah work outside of New York, but a lot of it is New York inflected, yeah. right? Whether yeah. it's historical or mm -hmm. performance wise. Yeah. So I'm wondering about how one does this. Like, are you are you from New York? Like where, where did the interest in theater start? Uh, Patrice, maybe you can start us off. Sure, I mean, I, uh, I am from New York. Uh, my parents were on Long Island, Queens, Long Island girl. Talk long Me enough too. to come <laughs> out, yeah. A lot of my family sounds like Fran Drescher. <laughs> um, sorry, mom, I love you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I, I think I've, I've just been doing this forever. I've been really fortunate that uh, my mom's a, a visual artist and was always incredibly supportive of us from the beginning, giving us all sorts of puppets and costumes. My grandmother, who had studied directing a bit, was like kind of the first mentor of mine. And I roped my siblings and neighbors into doing various um, reconstructions and recreations of classic tales and cinema. Um, yeah, and then I, I studied dance. That was kind of my first performance love for a while. And um, through a lot of different forking and winding paths, I found my way to like this experimental interdisciplinary space. Uh, but I actually went to Hunter College for undergrad, studied dance, uh, English, poetry specifically, and anthropology. And um, I just was always, I was always sticking my head in different weird art spaces in New York. It's something I've just always been doing. And I did a bunch of stuff downtown at like Bowery Poetry Club when I was uh, a teenager. And in my early college years and just been bopping around downtown theater for a while. Well, what is amazing is that you've, you've, you know, made a profession of your passions, you know, that all of these wonderful things that you were interested in have crystallized and you're doing shows based on those passions. Um, I, I saw some of your choreography that's on your website. It's spectacular, oh. you know, to just, uh, so, so really wonderful is, do you have any words of advice for people out there who are listening, who may be struggling to get to the place where you are? Uh, well, I still feel like I'm struggling because yeah. I, think I think though that's part of it. And one of like the, the biggest like growths I've been able to have, and it's actually just this weird sense of relief when you accept that that's actually like that's the work. I think like we talk about the work in a lot of different ways. And part of it is that there will always be um, 
there will always be that grant. There will always be that theater you want to work at. There will always be those people. There will always be those reviews. There will always be something to strive towards and also feel terrible about sometimes. But once you kind of accept that, I think it's a lot like anything else in life. You're like, oh, I can, I can do this because I love it and because I'm committed to it. And a commitment means you have down days, <laughs> right? Like any relationship. Um, yeah. And I think the most important thing I've found is to, to find your people and to find where you're loved. Um, what is it? Go where you're loved, stay where you're watered, um, which can be hard, um, especially in a city like New York, where like just the financial demands of, of making work here alone is, is really overwhelming. Um, but there are, there are as many ways to make art as there are artists making it. And I think finding your folks is, is the first step and um, yeah. And just, and, and, and giving in turn to those people too. Like I'm, I'm a big fan of like caring for each other in this industry. Um, I think that that's, I think it helps. I think it helps all of us and the work. So. I totally agreed. And obviously you found an, a, a really wonderful partner in Tim. How, how did you all meet? How did this collaboration happen? You know, it's so funny, Karen, because I'm trying to think now, Patrice, my memory of meeting you is through my hunter classmate, Jesse, Jesse, but we, we seem, but I feel like we knew about each other beforehand. Like, do you, do you have a memory of? We have met like multiple times in multiple spaces, oh, okay. multiple parties, like, but I, I, my first, well, cause you and I both work with Candace Lawrence, who's a fantastic uh, costume yeah. designer. And I, there was a theater Christmas party we were both at a couple of years ago where I remember Candace was like, you have to meet Tim. Um, oh, Candace, who was the producer, by the way, of Horseplay. She Horseplay. was the director at that time for, for, uh, for Askew at, at that point. Yeah. So yeah, well, and, and also, so Patrice and I also kind of go back to the Ludlow theater scene of the 90s. Um, and I, I, this history is getting lost and I don't understand why, but, but there used to be theaters on Ludlow Street on the Lower East Side, <laughs> the Photo Conada and the Collective Unconscious and the Piano Store and House of Candles and the Present Company. And there was a whole community of independent theater artists. And there's a lot of folks who are like uh, Elevator Repair Service. John Collins did his first show at Toto Conada. Um, David Herskiewicz, Target Margin Theater, his, they did their first show at Toto Conada. There are these amazing important theater artists who got their start there. Um, the, the New York International Fringe Festival came out of that community. Everybody forgets this. John Clancy, who ran the present company, Aaron Bell, who ran Toto Conada, it was their brainchild to do the Fringe Festival. Mm. Um, after that neighborhood became totally gentrified and we lost all of those spaces, all those spaces are gone now. A lot of the folks who were sort of, a lot of the core people at Toto Conada migrated to a space in East Williamsburg called The Brick. And I think Patrice, that's kind of really where you- That's really, yeah. yeah I mean right? The but but there was such a, like, there was such, I mean, they were my colleagues. And so I think that's kind of how we were all just kind of part of the same community. And even though we hadn't worked together, we knew of about each other. <clears throat> so yeah. that downtown scene on, on Ludlow Street, well, you know, consider this an oral history. Like we're, yeah. we're getting this down and people who watch this can maybe think about reviving the study of this. Yeah. So that whole downtown scene was wiped out in the Lower East Side? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, what, what's left of it in some sense, like the East 4th Street theaters have a lot of connections to those uh, initially, mm. those like uh, those theaters, um, but those spaces are, are gone. Um, all gone. And the brick is kind of the exile space. I mean, it's not, it's now it's, it's, the brick is over 15 years old and has its, its own- There was also, history. not to interrupt, there's also a real sense of community. like. You would go see an eight o'clock show at the Toro Canada and then catch the midnight show at Collective Unconscious, right? And so and so, who was the head of this company, would come in and do. And then we did the Foreman Festival, which we, we did all of Richard Foreman's plays. And it was like, it, and we would like, we kind of just all worked together. Like it was, it, and like you just go and hang out there. Like 
oh, I feel like, oh, I'll just go down and see what's playing. And you always knew somebody and it was very much a community. And, and I think I miss that. I mean, I really do miss those days. Um, and I guess hence the collaboration here, right? Yeah. Like hence uh, idea of collaboration. Tim, you, you go further back than that. You wanna tell us how you got your start? Um, well, you know, I've always, I just knew I wanted to do theater since I was like early adolescence. And um, I got cast in the all white version of The Wiz at North Scranton Intermediate School, which I know <laughs> I'm not supposed to talk about because, but I just, but, but that it was my begin. I always joke because I'm a big ridiculous theater guy. I'm a huge Charles Ludlam acolyte. And so I say, I've been doing ridiculous theater from the first thing I ever did, because what could be more ridiculous than an all white version of the Wiz, right? So I see the humor in it. I see like how, how pathetic it was that we were doing that, right? Um, and um, unlike Patrice, I, there are no artists in my family. Um, my parents did everything they could to to not, they did not want me to pursue this. They did everything they could to stop me. Um, and I uh, auditioned for both the Carnegie Mellon and NYU undergrad uh, theater programs. And much to everyone's surprise, except for mine, I got into both. And, um, but Carnegie Mellon, I had auditioned for the acting program and I got a, I got, I don't think I've ever heard of this have happening anywhere else, but I got a rejection letter from Carnegie Mellon. And they said, we don't think you belong in the acting program, but we're starting a directing thing, Elena Pinto Simon. She knew what was going on and she actually called, she actually called my parents and insisted on an in-person meeting in her office in New York City. My parents drove that down to New York. I'm from Scranton, Pennsylvania. And she, I, I, it was amazing. She, she said, she pulled him into her office and she said, I, your son belongs here your son in our program and I give you my personal assurance that you will be okay and that did it and I never looked back I moved I came to New York when I was 18 and suddenly this whole world of downtown theater that I had never heard of in Scranton I didn't know about Richard Foreman I didn't know about you know the Mabu Mines I didn't know about Omama I didn't know about any of these things um and I got involved with a, a company, um, Gorilla Rep, what was Rocket Fam at the time, then became Gorilla Rep, and they do the, the sort of famous Midsummer Night's Dream every summer in Washington Square Park. It's like a, this sort of tradition now. And I was in the second company of that show, and that, I, that was it. I was in Downtown Theater Guy ever since. Wow, it, it's really interesting to hear the story of that, that person. Wow, it, it's really interesting to hear the story of that that person at Carnegie Mellon who knew to bring your parents. No, N NYU, Ellen. Oh, NYU, sorry, sorry, but your just- school, Your school, my dear. <laughs> right, the, the idea to just like bring the parents in, right, to, yeah. to make it real was was the key, I guess. Wow, so um, so Whitman, right? Because I yeah. think the Body Electric really focuses on Whitman. And, and Patrice, you've talked about your poetry background. Tim, you're kind of more of a pure theater guy. So, so how did Whitman get into the mix here? Well, to kind of tag, I'm actually going to tag on to answer this question. I'm going to tag on to the question about like, how do you make this happen, right? Mm. In my life, in my quote unquote career, which, you know, some people would not consider that a career, but whatever. Oh, come on. Oh, no, 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 no. There's, yeah. Uh, I, I, I just keep going through whatever door opens. That's my advice. Like if you want to ask my advice, just whatever door opens, walk through it. Because as long as doors keep opening, you're going to get someplace. I truly believe that. Um, the production that how we know each other, the horse type production. Um, was a watershed moment in my life, but not in a good way. It was, it actually ended up being one of the worst experiences. It actually was the worst experience in my life. As proud as I was of as that show, it cost me dearly. Um, I lost my company. I lost my apartment. I lost my job. It was, it was, it was, oh my God. 
I almost killed myself. I almost committed suicide twice. I mean, it was, a, it was bad. It was really bad. Um, I'm still paying off the debts from that show. And the only thing, the only door, and this is so weird that we're having this conversation, Karen, and I really give you credit for this. I actually have to give, I'm going to publicly give you credit for this because it was through you that I met the Parachute Literary Arts folks. Oh, you know, she's coming on in September, Amanda, yeah. Amanda Deutsch, yeah. Amanda's wonderful. I adore Amanda. Absolutely. And she, you asked me to do the Song of Myself Marathon that year. I have a photo. I tell you, Karen, I got to tell you, that, that, was a, that was a moment. You were one of the people who saved my life that, that year. I'm going to be very honest with you because I really thought it was over for me. I was in such a dark, horrible place after that production. And that Whitman, Walt Whitman was literally the little light that actually kept me going. <laughs> So I met Amanda and she asked me to do, they did their wonder wheel thing. And I did a short Whitman piece. I did a little choreograph choreography too, but we were in the wonder wheel. So it was like very limited. And then they were gonna do their 200th anniversary celebration on the beach at Coney Island. And I did one of his sea poems, and I did a more elaborate choreographed thing. And it went, it went over very well. The, the great gay performance artist, John Kelly, who's a friend of mine, was there. And you know, John is like one of my heroes. He's like one of my, one of my heroes. And he said to me, Tim, you're on to something. Keep, keep going with this. And I didn't want to just do, like take a poem and like do choreography to it and recite the poem. I just think that seemed like dumb to me. Like, why would I do that? And I kind of had this sort of intuitive little um, itch to, and was audacious, right? I'm gonna, to rewrite Walt Whitman. I'm like, Who, what did you rewrite Walt Whitman? So that kind of that little that thought occurred to me. And then I didn't do it because it was like, why might I do that? Why would I do this? Why would I do this? And then COVID happened, the lockdown happened. And I ended up staying for six months. My friends who live on the Upper West Side, they gave me their triplex. They went down to their beach house and they gave me their triplex for six months. So I had this like amazing lockdown experience in this huge apartment, beautiful apartment with the garden. It was crazy. And I brought just a few books with me, but one of the books I brought with me was my Walt Whitman collection. And I'm like, okay, you need to do this. Like you, John Kelly told you, you need to keep going with this. So you've got to fucking, sorry, I don't mean to curse, but you've got to figure out what you're going to do with this. So one afternoon that spring, I'm sitting there like, like with nothing to do. And I open, okay, I said, look, you just gotta do this. So I open, I open up my huge collection, right? Big, thick collection of all Whitman poems, which is very intimidating. And I, I thought I was gonna work with the song of myself. That's kind of what my initial impulse was, but I'm paging through it and Karen, literally, I just saw, I sing the body electric and I, and I thought I ping the body electric and that was it. And that's how I knew that was the one I needed to do. It just, it wasn't even, it was like, it just called to me. I'm going to, I'm going to show a couple of photos on the screen okay. so that people know that you actually are Walt Whitman, because remember <laughs> I met Tim, uh, everybody, when he was performing in the Ada Isaacs Mencken play Horseplay, he played among other characters, Whitman in that play. Um, but take a look at this. I've got two things here that I'm going to show. I guess first, maybe I'll show this one first. So this is Tim in 2015 enunciating Walt Whitman to a crowd at the Song of Myself Marathon. And I knew a star was being born because you had such a theatrical way of bringing him to life. It was a huge hit at that marathon. I wish we would have a recording of it. And the, the photo before, do you know who that is? Do you guys know John Farrell? Well, I, I remember him because that, that's me. That's actually me behind you. Um, yeah. 
remember him. I mean, I remember him from that, from the tour. So I was leading a tour of the Bohemian New York uh, and so forth. And John Farrell, who for a while was dressing as Walt Whitman and just randomly walking around and spouting quotes and joined me all the time on all these things I did. He was there, but what really struck me was you kind of in the background of this photo. And Whitman wrote a poem about Foss called The Two Vaults because the ceiling of Foss was vaulted and there were actually two different spaces. One of them was really for the Bohemians. So I call this photo, the two waltz, because <laughs> not, not only am I next to, I'm next to John, who was an incredible Whitman. And John, if you're out there, man, we love you. You know, just come back with this. It was so awesome, wild and awesome. Um, but you, as I recall, Tim, you actually recited Whitman down in that space where where Walt, for all we know, had his first sexual encounter down there. Yeah. So I, it was I can't believe you remembered that because I had I actually had completely forgotten that detail. I for, I forgot that I did that. So this piece has been a long time coming. And it's been I, a long time coming. I appreciate your story of, you know. I was speaking with my students recently about Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, which is this great crisis poem. And Whitman in that poem mm -hmm. basically kind of like says, is everybody gonna laugh at me for what yeah. I do? It's very hard for an artist to be humble enough to see like when crisis comes and actually talk about it. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think you are helping so many people right now, Tim. Thank you for being oh. so, so candid, but also just, for showing how things really open up. And so this piece comes and you have the idea for it. And can you can you tell me how Patrice, how you fit into this? Like what are the, what is the division of tasks with the show? Uh, sure, uh, so initially we were working over Zoom because everyone was still, uh, you know, more or less in, in this space. Um, and Tim initially just emailed me and was like, who wrote this, what do you think? I was pretty, pretty. I had this crazy idea to turn this into a performance thing. And I read it and I was like, I'm game. Uh, I have a special love of poetic performance. I have a little weird academic or academic artist interest in uh, language and gesture work and embodied text and whatever we call, I guess, inscribing the body. Um, yeah, so I was like, yeah, let's let's do it. And uh, we worked through the text initially. We, it was, it's almost a little bit of a traditional process because we, we were going back and forth with the text like uh, I would with, I guess, a normal playwright. Um, but we hammered out. There wasn't too much editing left. Um, and some of it we did discover later as we were on our feet. Yeah. And then we tried to just tackle what um, what it means to to, to do this, what does it mean as a whole? And of course there's, it's multiple sections. So what does it mean to also have these sections live on their own uh, while also contributing to something bigger? Yeah. Um, but they're not scenes and, and there's not a like a beginning, middle and end in the same as the usual sense of like, you know, two different people, they meet, that's then they fall in love, they fight, they get back together at the end, right? Um, so yeah, we, once we were able to get in person, we had a couple of strategies to try to figure out what we wanted to do. We had had some movement exercises. We talked about just what, how each of the pieces felt, where they came from, some of the big imagery in them. Um, I basically just brought my whole toolkit to it and I work fairly intuitively at this point. Um, so sorry to anybody who's always by books and has like a set process. Um, I, I really believe that each project has its own language and its own set of questions and heart. And the, our job is to listen to it and find out what it wants to be and how 100%. we present there. So yeah, and we've just really, we've always been on the same page with that. And um, we landed through a series of conversations um, while we were simultaneously doing some choreo work, doing some text work, doing some what happens if we just speak this as a monologue work, uh, trying to find a broader framework. And I was like, well, this does have out, like this might feel a little bit like a, like a ritual we can think about it, especially as we were realizing we we're gonna be outdoors to start and doing something that's a little bit interventionist. I was like, well, how do we be present in a way that is meaningful 
and inviting, but also challenging. And that has an inside core where Tim as the performer can be in control and safe um, and move through the piece, but also allow an audience to come together. And we kind of settled on a ritual um, structure that basically comes from like cultural anthropology work of like, what is a ritual? <laughs> yeah. uh, and influenced a lot by some kind of like neo-pagan or Wiccan, um, love magic, all sorts of different traditions, uh, but all funneled through the kind of queerness of the piece and the queerness of, of Whitman and that like the legacy. Yeah. Wow, wow, like there are many things to think about here. Just for the audience, I Sing the Body Electric is one of Whitman's mid-size lyrics. So not quite as deep as Song of Myself, but not kind of short like the Calamus poems. Um, it's got nine sections, at least in the last iteration that Whitman did. And Whitman kind of had, I guess, ideas of groupings of of scenes. Um, so, so I guess you guys were using that to kind of like guide yourself around the poem. Yeah. Um, I'm really interested in this idea of queer ritual. I know you describe the piece as queer ritual and the word ritual stuck in my mind, Patrice, while I was reading about you, because I see that you call yourself a lazy witch. Very, very interesting. So, you know, I wondered about what you meant by queer ritual and I know you don't have a recording of the piece and maybe Tim pretty soon it'll be a good time for you to do uh, a <coughs> representation so we can get an idea of it um, and maybe maybe that should go first right so people can actually help answer this poem about how it how it is a, a ritual but do you want to give a preface before Tim does his reading as to how people should should kind of be processing this Sure. Um, I think the, the larger um, picture of it is that it kind of follows what um, what is kind of happening in like a, a very current moment of contemporary, what people call witchcraft or polytheism. And there's a lot of that actually, the, the structures of those rituals um, come from cultural anthropology work um, by people like uh, Gardner, but also like Victor Turner. And there's like kind of these classical definitions of ritual, but they're um, very performative. And that's something that I, I jam on spiritually and uh, artistically, um, that there are ways to kind of create these um, happenings that are, uh, they're controlled happenings, um, that have some person in charge, some roles, but that there's, there are ideas like communitas, where we're all together kind of in the same place, like our classes and our races and our genders and our sexualized, all these things kind of fall back a little bit and we are all people together. Um, in the work towards transformation, which is really what defines a, a ritual is you walk out different than you were. Um, sometimes they're very specific. Sometimes they're a little more open-ended um, like a performance, like a theatrical performance might be. Um, but also like queer rituals are, I think are really very present right now in, in, in performance and in uh, queer activism. I mean, this also goes back to like, to act up um, and a big part of, of I think the, this moment in queer activism is, is understanding our lineages and our ancestors. And so very specifically this section actually does um, really talk about a very important um, queer ancestor activist. Um, it talks about Larry Kramer and ACT UP. I don't wanna to give too much more away about it because it's really beautiful and it speaks for itself very strongly. <laughs> so. Okay. Well, yeah. well, and just just to tag in really quickly about the ritual thing before we actually get to the text, because I think hearing the text, people are gonna be like, wait, that's not a ritual. Like, because it's mm -hmm. text mm -hmm. I'm about to read does not necessarily lend itself to the idea of ritual in maybe our most our pedestrian understanding of that word. And that's kind of the point. Because all of these references, contemporary references, historical references, cultural references are existing within a structure that we've created physically to provide a forward momentum and a sense of energetic crescendo in something that the German theater theorist Hans Steelman would describe as post-dramatic theater, mm -hmm. right? This is not a dramatic text. There is no, there's no two characters having a conflict and the audience is involved in how that, that conflict is going to resolve, right? It, 
So we had to find something that would create a sense of momentum and movement. And that's how we came to the ritual aspect of it. And it's, I mean, it's also, let's, let's, it, it's sex magic. I mean, I see this as a I mean, sex magic without actually, you know, whipping it out on the street, right? That mm -hmm. is what this really is. And I think that's what, I mean, I was like, I was the one who, who got there, right? Patrice, I'm like, I don't know, I'm, I think I want to do sex magic. And um, yeah. Yeah. And, and we've, we like the, the set as it, as it were, um, does involve at one point, like, uh, four, uh, hoodoo voodoo sex magic candles that are penis shaped, uh, standing out on the street, which, right. uh, was also like a very fun interventionist, uh, act of, but they're also really cute colors. So like, horrible. They don't necessarily know what it is when they first look at it. Right. Yeah. It's a really, yeah, it's a really beautiful, um, I think it's a very beautiful set. Maybe I'm biased, but uh, yeah, yeah. It's because it's not, it's also not about and much like the piece and because of, of I think how the text works and how, why we found that structure initially was that it's not an exploitive gotcha. Um, even uh, like the sexuality of it is, is, is about the deeper curiosity, desire, meaning conflict, right. Um, that exists. And that I think, fits neatly under what we consider a queer theory or queerness and and, and, and wonder and and chance and mm -hmm. yes yes part of what i was responding to in writing it i mean i'm responding to a lot of things in writing it but like one of where it starts off and like the first section it's very much about how so much of gay male sexuality now is all happens online and it's all there's no, it doesn't feel like the, the magic isn't there anymore. It's like, okay, what do I want? I want a daddy who's hairy, who's got this and got that. Blah, blah. Okay, let's find fun who's going to meet that. It's all very, it's, it's like ordering off of a menu nowadays. And so part of what I'm trying to do is just bring some magic back into how gay men think about our own sexuality. I mean, among other things, right? That's very cool because if I think about the motivation Whitman had for writing that piece, it was to uh, to celebrate the body, to celebrate physicality during a moment when physicality was considered a taboo topic. So, by Whitman, you know the the last part of this poem is a catalog of body parts that gets very specific, right? Yeah. Man balls, man root are in there, and yeah. he was terrifying Victorians with this poem, right? Yeah. Which <laughs> banned left and right. And now, Tim, what you're saying is you've revived it because we've actually turned away from the very thing that Whitman was hoping to open up, right? So we've had our moment of openness and now ironically, we're shutting that door. So this yeah. is- and, well, and, and in my version of that list, it, it's, it's everything that's wrong with my body. Ah. Well, it's, my body it is, it, as it is right now, that does not meet that grinder, scruff, man, me, um, ideal, right? It is a devastating, um, beautiful performance that Tim gives, especially in that last, I, yeah. I mean, you can, you should see the whole piece, but everyone should absolutely see the last part. I, I will, I will also say though, that um, I think what, that there's a tension in Whitman's work that is both the the celebration of i mean there is arguably some cruising happening in that poem it's oh, yeah. it's a pretty queer poem um and it is and it, it, it's so characteristically whitman in that he's it's it's a walking poem it's a looking at people poem and it is a deep celebration of physicality with that comes though the complications of the white gaze of what it means to conscribe or inscribe other bodies with language that we use and so like the, what Tim is doing is I think also living, like when, when we are making this piece, we live in that tension. Um, be, and I think that that's a really, I, I don't know, it's exciting and it's valuable because it's in almost a weird way, some of what Whitman does may arguably feel closer to some paying a culture with the menu idea. Like cataloging is a, such an interesting um, device to use, right? And it kind of can, can have an objectifying um, effect, right, on mm -hmm. others, especially people who are capital O others, and in particular for women, I think that that's, that's uh, Black people, right? So mm -hmm. that's a really important thing to, uh, for us to acknowledge and also see how, how do we relate to that in terms of 
a, a camera digital culture, but also in this moment of, uh, of reckoning, right, um, with, with Black Lives Matter. So it, it's, it's a very exciting thing to be able to also kind of talk with our weird queer daddy ancestor about that because yeah. he was in it. He was, he was, he was in it. So just wanted to, yeah. Um, well, speaking of we, queer daddy ancestors, I think I want to do section three. Um, and just the what, just one thing I want to say about this. So, um, you know, this is the section, the father of many sons section, right? In the poem. And when I was working on this, and this really is a line by line, I, I went, I was very, very rigorous about that. Like I was like, okay, there are 26 syllables in this line. I have to come up with a 26 syllable version of this line that that's contemporary. Oh my gosh, Tim, that's crazy. Wow. Yeah, it was, no, it was so, oh my God, it was so much fun. It's like doing this amazing puzzle. Like it was like this great puzzle to have to try to figure out. And I would use, I mean, some of the lines are puns. I pun on an image that, that Whitman is using. So I'm also doing, there's a, there's a dialogue with his original text here. But I would get to a new, I would like crack a section and I'd be like, oh, wow, I cracked that section. And then I would get to the next section. And I'd be like, I have no idea what to do with this. So I got to this section. I'm like, father, many sons. I'm a gay man. And I just, I didn't know what to do. And then suddenly it hit me, Larry Kramer. And what's really weird about this is I wrote this like literally two weeks before Kramer died. Like it was really weird. Um, so, but this is what came out and I feel like this, when I got to this part, that's like what really, then I knew what I was doing. So just for the listeners, listeners who have their books in front of them, they can actually weirdly follow you along because you are using the same syllable structure. Mm -hmm. So I am, I have my book right here, Tim. Yeah. And I, I don't know if I want to do it because I want to listen to you at the same time, but I love the idea and I'd love to see this performed. You must tell us what's going on with. Yeah, well, why, don't you, Patrice, why don't you tell them what's happening while I'm saying this? Oh, sure, with the performance itself. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, we're here now. Uh, <laughs> that's what's happening. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so uh, this is section three of the performance. We've already gotten the, um, the penis candles out and four quarters basically creating uh, a diamond or a circle, depending on how you're looking at it. And uh, Tim lays down in the middle of this sex of this this part between all of the penises. And on the sidewalk. On the sidewalk. On <laughs> 14th uh, Street. And uh, pulls out a piece of white chalk. And as he speaks this text, he uh, draws the outline of his body on the ground. Okay, and this, but this could be anywhere, right? Because you guys are going to move it around. Mm -hmm. Chalk right. goes lots of places very easily. Okay, <laughs> sounds great. All right, Tim, looking forward to this. There was a man, a well-known writer, father of many sons, some of whom are fathers of sons, but many of whom are not. This man was once of terrifying drive, rage, force for one person. The squareness of head, salt and pepper stubble shadowing his jaw, the intensity of coal black eyes against pale skin, the gruffness of manner. I never went to see him because I feared daddy's force and fire. He seemed 60 feet tall and older than everything. His sons wore leather jackets and Doc Martens. They loved him, sons and daughters, though they also feared him. His love did not allow closeness. His love was impersonal for all. His plays splattered milk, on the floor, his action paintings blood on pavements and streets. He was a frequent guest where his presence wasn't welcome. He prophesied like Cassandra wandering in the wilderness. He chewed off the hands that fed him and shook fists at his families. 
When he went to scream at the obscenities of science and the vanities of fame, his sons lay down in the streets and he stood out from all. You would wish to be kissed by him. You would wish to stand by him in the street that he might look and say, this was done well. Wow, wow. Oh my goodness. I, just, first of all, the, you know, the performance is spectacular, but then to see how you fit it into the poem. Well, I shouldn't say that. It doesn't fit into the poem. It, it amplifies the poem, right? It, it, it uncovers an underbelly of this poem. And I don't know if you know this, but in, um, in another poem called There Was a Child Went Forth, Whitman almost does as much as come out and say that his father was abusive to him. You know, a lot, a lot of people read There Was a Child Went Forth. He, he's got a couple of lines in there that say something like, the father, strong, something mean, angry, unjust, the blow, the quick, loud word. Uh, so, so there's this feeling, and I don't think I'm the only Whitman scholar who feels this way, that there was an abusive relationship between father and son. So you, well, you haunted me with this because yeah. it sort of uncovers maybe what Whitman really meant to say, you know, to sort of a, a level that that kind of he coasts over somehow in this text. So I can I actually have a question for you. Yeah. Was he talking about a specific person in this section? Or I mean, I, I was very intrigued by that. Like, is he is there some is what are the theories about that or what? Because it's very opaque, like he's an artist and he gets to have his secrets. <laughs> so he, he, never, he never but there's no sort of sense that he was maybe hinting at some one specific or well honestly his father was a common farmer mm. and i forget how many sons may have uh, he had eight children i think oh, wow. five of them were sons so you know you could you could kind of piece things together if right. you wanted. there's definitely a resemblance to his to his own father out Interesting. there Interesting. Right? Um, and the bits and bobs that we know about Whitman Sr. kind of fit into what he says here. But the, the line in the original poem, he says, he drank water only. The blood showed like scarlet through the clear brown skin of his face. His father was a massive alcoholic. Oh, wow. So whether this was a cleanup job of Whitman Sr. or not, what you would do, and if I were critiquing your performance, I would say that this is a, maybe not just a, a wonderful performance to watch, but for people who are in tune with Whitman and want to get kind of at another, another layer, right? Oh, another no, understanding, no. You're, you're digging into something that probably a lot of people feel, but you have put into words. So, so, so anyway, when you're saying this, you're lying on the ground. And as Patrice was telling us, you are drawing yeah, and, and the game is for, for me to try to keep my body as flat as possible. And there's this whole like intense abdominal thing where like I actually come up and like, I'm trying to like never let the chalk leave the floor. So it's this very intense specific physical task um, that is personally my favorite moment as a performer in the piece. Like it always feels so powerful to do that. And like, you can feel people going, oh my God, like, and then I stand up and the part about, you would wish to stand by him in the street that he might look and say, this was done well. I refer to my own, the wow. dead body outline, right? Like that's, so it's, it, and that, and that was Patrice. I, that was, that was, that's where, that's where Patrice, that's why I wanted to work with Patrice because that was her idea to do that. And, um, and that's why it's such a great collaboration because as soon as she said it, I'm like, yeah, that's what we, exactly, that's what, yes. Well, it speaks on so many levels. It's it, it seems to me very current and relevant, you know, to speaks to police brutality, yep. right? like uh, yep. drawing that line of the body, yep. line around the body. It speaks of sort of like a, 
an awareness of like the shell of the body uh, as opposed to the interior position yep. of the body. So um, I, I'm wondering, cause I, you know, I'm gonna have to let you guys go soon because we keep this show to an hour and I've yeah, already- Yeah, totally, yeah, of course. <laughs> but I'm, I'm just, I'm very intrigued with this. Where, what would you like the show to do? Like, do you feel like you have a particular message that you're trying to say or- like if our, our very message, dear yeah. our our very dear friend Elisa Simon, who's another one of the old Toto Konana folks, Elisa came to see it and she said the most extraordinary thing. She named it. She said, You are casting a spell for empathy. And that goes to what you all were saying about the activist stance of yeah. this. So there is something about this performance that opens the heart. Yeah. Um, so how can we see it? Like, because I know we, you don't even have a real recording of the entire thing, right? No. Um, well, we are, we, we're, apply, um, we're applying for a grant that if we get it, we hope to do, be doing a few more performances in uh, September. And, if there, and also if there are people out there listening um, how can they get in touch with you all if they were interested in maybe checking out the show? Helping out some way. <laughs> I, I guess they could go to your websites or. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah we, we both have, I have a website and also our, the piece has an, a website that um, needs to be updated and will be updated after tonight. <laughs> but it's actually a really wonderful website. I learned a lot of information from it and there are several images on there that will help. <laughs> people see more what you're doing. Um, yes, pingthebodyelectric.com. So that's the site that you can go to. Yeah. I'm really uh, impressed because it's, it's difficult to understand it from the outside. And I feel like the reading kind of really helped clarify, Tim, what is mm -hmm. going on here, mm -hmm. the layeredness of the piece. I love how generous it is and how open both of you are um, to, to, to just creating a piece that really helps people through a difficult time. And I'm moved that it's out of crisis, right? Yeah. You mentioned that, you know, it's not just the COVID crisis, but AIDS, um, the whole thing that kind of informs this piece. So would you, would you call it, is it biographical on your part? Is, oh, well, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. So you keep saying it's it's kind of about you, it's kind of about Whitman, but it's also about everyone, right? There's yeah. like a part of it that will get to everybody. Yeah. You know, Karen, there, yes, it is. And and when I was when I do the piece, there is a moment, I think it always happens in the um, yeah, in section six, which is the which is the very much the COVID, uh, it's kind of very directly about COVID. Mm -hmm holding an orange, which in my mind is actually Donald Trump, but you know, it could just be an orange. Um, I'm doing stuff with the orange. Um, and there, it happened the first time I did it in art, in art Not Places, and I suddenly felt like I was channeling Walt. I had this very intense moment. And Patrice, you had the same experience, right? You too. It just suddenly I felt like I was, I was Walt. I can't, I can't explain it any other way. I'm not acting him. I'm I'm me doing this ritual. But there was there's I just every time I do it, I feel in that moment he suddenly were there. He's there. It's very strange. Hmm. What an inspiring place to leave this. We yes. absolutely must see it. And Tim and Patrice, I want to thank you both for being so lovely and so candid. I wish we could just all go out for beers or something. <laughs> And actually, just like get Tim to kind of enunciate more of the show. <laughs> oh, do I hear a tavern, a tavern performance in the future? Those are my favorite kinds. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'm even thinking for the the New York City Poetry Festival, mm. like because it's an outdoor piece. Oh you know, yeah. Maybe, maybe I can persuade you guys to come along and, yeah. and provide some snippets for. Star. For folks, you don't need to persuade us, Karen. Tell when, <laughs> there. what time do you want us there? <laughs> the props are in a bag, ready to go. <laughs> sure. Yes. Yes. 
I love you guys. I love the way that Whitman somehow manages to bring together such incredible, wonderful, creative people. Yeah, Thank right. You. Thank you so and, much. And, and just, can I just say one thing about noticing the people, you, how, how feckened Whit Whitman is, like how many other artists get inspired by him. Like it's just, I was kind of all over the place, like poets and visual artists and choreographers. And it's just like amazing how he keeps speaking through people. And, and what is great too is as you have showed, it's not just like hero worship, it's great. Like yeah. this, this piece critiques him rightly so on the issue of race. And I wish we had more time to get to that. But Patrice, you mentioned that. And of course there's that, um, the body at auction part here, which is troubling on some levels, beautiful on others. It's always a, yeah. a balancing act to teach or talk about that section. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'm gonna leave it at that because I have to let you go, but there's much more to talk about. I hope to see you guys in person soon. Yes. And I wanna also thank Jesse Mirandi. Jesse, woo! Who saved the day, stepped in, and absolutely held forth as he does. And the show would not happen without him. So thank you so much, Jesse. There he is. Yay! <laughs> okay, everyone. We'll see you August 10th for uh, the Canadian Whitmanites and uh, Patrice and Tim. All the best. We can't wait to hear where the show goes next. Thank you, Karen.